Hey guys, welcome back to Chapel. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. His name is Brian Guy. Um, he's a youth pastor in Kingsburg. Please give him a big hand. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Don't mind my cup. It's my wife's, but I needed water before I was leaving. Um, so, like you said, my name is Brian Guy. I am currently the youth pastor at Community Church. So I just started out as the youth pastor this school year, and it has been wonderful. It's been challenging, but it has also been a blessing, and it's been a way that God has been um, strengthening my faith. And so for you, I know that um, your students, a lot of you attend a youth ministry of some sort. And so you don't understand how much you pour into your youth pastor as much as we pour into you. So just wanted to share that with you. Now, um, I understand last week you were ta you, your speaker was talking about missions, yes? Is that correct? Yes, anyone? Can you help me out? We, missions, yeah? Okay, awesome. So we're sort of continuing that today, except we're not talking about missions overseas. We're talking more evangelism. We're talking missions here and now, or essentially missions wherever you are. So when I became the youth pastor at Community Church, I sat down, I have a couple interns, one for high school, one for junior high. I sat down with my interns, and we drafted out a purpose statement for our youth ministry. Now, just curious, for all of you that attend a youth ministry, do you, do you have a purpose statement for your youth ministry? Do, do, does anyone know a purpose for your youth ministry. That's very typical, or else I understand you're tired and you don't want to raise your hand. Understandable. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's very typical for a youth ministry to just function and not have a purpose and become a glorified babysitting club. And I didn't want that to happen. And so we sat down and we drafted out this purpose statement. And within it, we have five eternal purposes that are built into it. Now, we didn't just come up with these five eternal purposes. We found them in the Bible. And I'm not going to go through our purpose statement with you this, this morning, but I am going to tell you the five eternal purposes, and we're going to focus on one of them. So the five eternal purposes that are built into our youth ministry are evangelism, baptism, discipleship, loving God and loving others. So if that sounds familiar, it should. It comes from the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. So, this morning we're focusing on the evangelism. The very start of our purpose statement says we strive to reach non-believing students. That is the first, that is the very start of our purpose statement. We strive to reach non-believing students. So this means that we are actively seeking to reach the lost. Our students are learning that they have a responsibility to seek out non-believing students and share about God's love and His grace and His free gift of salvation that's offered to all. But in order for our students to do that, for anyone to do that really, we need to understand the heart of God for the lost. And so, tonight, or I'm sorry, this morning, what we're going to be looking at, we're looking at um, two kind of sections. We're looking at God's heart for the lost and our role in God's plan of redemption for humanity. And when we look at, um, when we look at God's heart for, for the lost, when we look at God's heart for non-believers, we're going to be looking at two of my favorite scriptures that help me to really understand God's heart. You see, I didn't become a Christian until I was in a senior in high school. And for me, it was really, if for me now, it's disappointing looking back and realizing there were, I didn't really have someone close to me to tell me about who Jesus was. Now, I understand it's a different scenario here um, at Emmanuel, where I can guess that most of you have, have faith in Jesus. But nonetheless, I'm sure you have interactions with non-believers outside of school. So let's jump into it. We're going to look at God's heart for non-believers. And if you have your Bibles, if not, I put it, we're going to throw it up on the screen. But we're going to start out in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 
a common memory verse that you learn when you're little. You learn it, you memorize it, and then you kind of just store it in the back of your head. But we're going to look at it because it really shows us God's heart. So it reads as follows. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So let's talk about this for a second. Um, we, God's written word is telling us something huge right here. And if we just kind of read over it, we don't really understand the heart of God. God loves the world. Do you, do you, do you grasp that? In other words, God loves humanity. He loves each and every single person he created. Now, this is the big part. He loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. Even when we were filthy and covered in sin, he still loved us. It's not, you're going to become clean and I love you. It's, I made you, I created you, I love you. But let's clean you up a bit. Now, here's the thing. He didn't have to do that. The penalty of sin is both physical and spiritual death. He could have just left us be, and he would be completely just in doing that. But we know God is also the justifier. So instead, God chose to love us. And he had a plan for us. He gave his only son to be a sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, to atone for the sins of the world. God desires for humanity to be restored back to him through his son, Jesus. This is God's heart. God loves us, but not just those within his family, those who are lost. So that brings us into Luke chapter 15. Verses 1 through 7, they read as follows. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Now we're, we're going to touch back on that in just a second. Um, as far as that last part goes. But here's the thing. Jesus told us this story to illustrate two things. The first is that God seeks out the lost. God seeks out the lost. This story clearly indicates that God cares about the sinner who is lost their way. This isn't a physical loss, like I'm in the mountains, I don't know where I am. This is a spiritual loss. God cares. And God is seeking to bring them home. The reality is every single person has an emptiness in their heart that can only be filled with God. And until that is filled, we are lost. So like we just said, the story illustrates how Jesus came for the sick, not the healthy. And what I mean by that is uh, you can help a lost person find their way home. Not that you are responsible for that, but you can be a part of that. Now, there, there is, um, sorry, that was the second point, was that Jesus came for the sick. So the first one, Jesus seeks out the lost, and the second one is that Jesus came for the sick. 
He came for those who were in need of salvation. Because the reality is we can't do it on our own. God's moral standard is himself, and that's moral perfection, and we can't reach it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's, it's not obtainable. So when we look into God's heart, we see that he loves humanity. He desires for humanity to be restored to him. And here's the best part. You get to play a role in God's plan of redemption for humanity. You get to play a role in that. Okay? And the reality is, you might think that that's a choice. It's not a choice. You've been commanded. And that's where we get that, that eternal purpose and our purpose statement. That's where we get it. We get it from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission. When Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, here's, here's the thing. Jesus said, go and make disciples. But this, when we read it, we can get confused. We start thinking literally a going. Like, you need to go. You need to go to Africa. You need to go to Europe. You need to go to South America. And we absolutely should for those who are called there. But that is not everybody. And here's the thing. What, what this really meant was as you go, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. Wherever you are, let that be both in location and in life. You live here in Reedley? All right, make disciples. You live in Kingsburg? All right, perfect. Make disciples. You're going away to college? Awesome. Wherever you are, make disciples. It's a command. You don't, being part of God's family, you don't have the luxury of putting that aside and just stealing the joy, just, just having that joy and not sharing it with anyone else. That's rude. Really? That's rude. You've been commanded as you go, wherever you are, both physically, spirit, like spiritually, wherever you are, you are to make disciples. Now, many of you might be thinking, well, okay, I'm not really good at public speaking. You know, God hasn't really put it on my heart to go do that. I'm not comfortable doing that. Well, there's this thing called trust. You need to trust God. Moses wasn't ready either. You need to trust God. And it has, doesn't have to be this big display. You don't have to be up here preaching to, to 100 people. That's not how everyone is meant to, to operate. It can be one-on-one -on -one interactions. And we'll, we'll get to, I have a few tips just to help you out. But nonetheless, you need to trust in God to help you with that. Also, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, and also 13 through 15, they say, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God chooses to use us in his great plan of redemption for the world. Those who have experienced his love, his grace, his mercy have the responsibility of sharing that with the world. The reality is people need Jesus. Every person needs Jesus. The sooner we realize that, the sooner it's going to shape our lives. 
They need to know the real Jesus. They need to know the Jesus that came for the sick, not the healthy. The Jesus who would rather sit at a table with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with sinners, if you will, rather than sit with the religious elite. The Jesus who showed compassion upon a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, we have been sent. It is our job to preach the good news of Jesus to the world so that they may hear, they may believe. Now, how can we make disciples where we are as we go? Well, let me, I have three things that I try to help our students with. The first one is to spend time with non-believers. Spend time with non-believers. Now, with that, we have to understand our lives should be a healthy balance. You must spend time with non-believers, but you also need to spend time with believers. It is, like I'm saying, it's a healthy balance. So when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he did spend time with his closest friends. But then there were times when he also spent with people who were outside, who were ostracized, who were sinners, if you will. In fact, the scripture that we looked at earlier in Luke that whole interaction was caused because Jesus was eating with people who were look, looked at as less than by the religious elite. So as for us, when I try to imagine this balance between time with believers and time with non-believers, I think of it as your close friends who are believers and time with non-believers Um, think of it this way. You can think of your friends as, it sounds corny, it sounds dumb, but you think of your friends as like a charging station. So you go, you spend time with your friends, and you don't, it just naturally, uh, at least for me and my friends, naturally, when I spend time with them, the love of God just radiates. And I feel better when I leave. And I feel more equipped for when I go and I interact with non-believers. Because when I'm interacting with non-believers, I'm pouring myself out. I'm pouring myself out. And if I'm not being recharged, both by God and by God's people, if I'm not being recharged, I'm going to run dry. So it's important to spend time with non-believers, but it's also important to spend time with believers, and especially spending a lot of time with God through His Word, through fellowship. So that's what I got for you for the first one, is to spend time with non-believers. The second one is culture. It's pr probably not what, you pr you're probably thinking it's something different. I'm, I'm talking culture, but I'm talking about the culture that you're going to develop around yourself. Don't think U.S. culture, don't think anything like that. Think about the culture you develop with you and your friends, okay? I spend a lot of time with high schoolers. And I spent a lot of time with our, our high school boys trying to teach them what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. They have a heart for Jesus, but sometimes they say just the most off-the-wall things. What kind of culture are you going to develop within your friend group? Are you going to develop a culture that you're tearing each other down all the time? Like, man, you're terrible at Fortnite, whatever. Or are you going to be developing a culture that's encouraging? Like, yeah, you're terrible, but let's work to get better. I don't know. Something of that nature. But here, I want to give you an example really quick before our time is out. Um, my wife, she, her best friend uh, went to Emmanuel. And I don't know if her husband went to Emmanuel, but he was on fire for the Lord. His name is Jacob. And any time, any time I hung out with Jacob, interacted with Jacob, he would ask me, as soon as, as soon as we sat down, it was just kind of us, he would say, hey, how are you and God? How's your relationship with God going? And I don't know what it was, it was this, this just something about him, I was like, sure, I'll tell you. And he's like, how's your, how's your marriage? How are you doing? How's your ministry? 
And he would, be, be, he would start asking me deep questions. That's the type of culture that I hope you can nourish and develop within your friend group. Obviously, there's times to joke and mess around, but if you're not encouraging one another, if you're not asking the hard questions, you're not being a faithful brother or sister in Christ. You're not. And here's the beauty of it. If you start to develop that within your close friends, it's going to carry over into your relationships with non-believers. Naturally, you're going to start telling them about who God is and what he is doing in your life. So that brings us to our last one of how we, can, how we can help to make disciples where we are. Is by praying and sharing. So I'm working on developing these cards for our youth ministry. And the way it's going to work is there's going to be um, a list available so they can put names on it. And this can be family members, it can be friends, but there's a list on one side followed by a series of boxes and then over here, there's going to be another section that has things such as um, sharing your testimony, sharing the gospel, telling, uh, telling the person why it is that you believe in what you believe, and asking them if they would like to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so the idea behind it is you have someone you're praying for throughout the school year, family member, friend, and those boxes... That's how many times each week you're praying for them. And after so many weeks, you need to share your testimony with them. And after so many weeks, you need to share the gospel. And after so many weeks, you need to share why it is that you believe that gospel. And after so many weeks, you have to, you have to ask, is this, is, has God been speaking to you? Do you know Jesus? You obviously don't have to do that. You can keep a journal, however you want to do it. But I encourage you to be constantly praying. Praying is powerful. Praying is powerful. That can be a whole other topic I'd love to discuss with you, but make sure you're praying and make sure you're sharing with non-believers. So let's always remember that God cares for the lost, and we should too. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the free gift of salvation that you offer through him. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you that when we were lost, you came searching for us. God, you are so mighty. You are so powerful. Would you use us? Would you equip us to go out and to be willing to be used by you, to trust you wherever we are, to share the gospel with every person we encounter? Holy Spirit, would you give us the words? We love you so much, and we thank you for loving us. Amen. Hey guys, we're going to pray for Brian real quick. Lord, I thank you for Brian. Uh, I pray that you help us all take his words in heart today and we go about our day thinking more about you. Amen. Seniors.